Hi everyone. We have so far discussed mitosis and the process of cell division as that relates to the entire cell cycle and what happens when cell division goes wrong. So today we're going to move on and we're going to discuss the structure of DNA, which if you remember has everything to do with mitosis because mitosis is the division of the cell's nucleus. And what does the nucleus contain? DNA. Okay. So let's start by reminding you of what even is it. Well, one, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Hopefully you knew that already because I have gone over that before. But basically DNA is genetic material that organisms inherit from their parents. So you got your DNA from your parents, your parents got their DNA from their parents, and so on and so forth. But what role does DNA play? What does it do? Well, the whole reason to even have it in the first place is to store genetic information because DNA is used for that purpose. Each cell has DNA because they need a blueprint of pretty much every gene, every, everything that that cell is going to do in its life is necessary to be stored in that DNA. So one of the first roles of DNA is storing that information. The other thing that DNA needs to be able to do is not only store it, but then also copy it. Because remember, if you're going to make a new cell, each cell needs a copy of the entire DNA of that organism. So you have to be able to copy the DNA as well. And then third, you have to be able to pass on genetic information with DNA. So one, we got to store that information in the first place. Two, we have to be able to copy it if we're making new cells. But three, if an organism wants to have offspring, it needs to be able to pass a portion of that DNA onto its offspring. Okay, so DNA as a whole is made up of a few different components. But if you remember from way back when we were talking about the organic molecules, the macromolecules, I said that DNA was made up of something called a nucleotide. Um, and you probably have since forgotten this, but a nucleotide is made up of a sugar, a phosphate, and also a nitrogen containing base. So I said sugar phosphate base a bunch of times during that particular notes PowerPoint and then that unit. Um, but each nucleotide in DNA is joined together by something called a covalent bond, which you will learn all about in chemistry. It's not important that you know specifically what a covalent bond is or even why covalent bonds are special, um, but you do need to know that covalent bonds exist between the nucleotides of DNA. And that covalent bond specifically exists between the sugar of one nucleotide and the phosphate of another. Okay, so let's take a quick look at each nucleotide, okay? So here we have the phosphate piece of a, of a nucleotide. Here, this pentagon is going to be the sugar portion. So again, if you remember way back when we were talking macromolecules, if you saw a hexagon or a pentagon, I told you to think of sugar. The same is true for sugar's presence in DNA. That pentagon shape is the sugar part. And then over here is the nitrogen containing base. Okay, so again, phosphate, sugar, base. Phosphate, sugar, base phosphate, sugar, base. So if you were looking to kind of outline each one of the nucleotides, here's one nucleotide, here's another nucleotide, here's a third, here's a fourth, okay? Um, so also, this covalent bond that I was referencing before also known as a phosphodiester bond, which is not important for you to have memorized. But this here is that covalent bond between the sugar of one and the phosphate of another nucleotide. So I just wanted to quickly point out where those things were. So let's recap 
once again. I just said that each nucleotide contains a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. But in DNA, that sugar has a specific name, and sugars end in OSE. So if we're talking about DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, that sugar is going to be called deoxyribose. If we're talking about RNA, which we will spend a lot of time talking about RNA later, um, that sugar is called ribose. But that is the entire reason that DNA is named as it is. It's because of that sugar deoxyribose that lends its name to deoxyribonucleic acid. The phosphate group, um, we're not going to learn a lot about the phosphate group and its purpose, but I do want you to know that it exists. Um, the phosphate group is basically the, at the far end here, it's usually represented by a circle, not always, but this is going to be your phosphate group there, bonded onto your sugar, which is bonded onto the base. About the bases, though, the bases are arguably one of the most important parts of DNA, and there are four kinds. There is A, T, C, and G. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And each of these bases has a slightly different shape and structure to it. Do they look exactly like the picture representation over here? No, absolutely not. They look actually nothing like this little concave rectangle and this convex rectangle over here. However, what this picture is trying to show you is that each of these bases fits together with one specific other base. So looking at this picture, you could figure out that A and T fit together from the shape that the picture is giving it, and you could figure out that G and C fit together by how that picture is representing them. How was the structure of DNA determined in the first place? Well, this guy named Erwin Chargaff, or Chargaff, or however you want to pronounce his name, discovered that the percentages of adenine and thymine bases matched in any sample of DNA, and that the percentages of cytosine and guanine matched in any sample of DNA, which doesn't sound that cool until you really think about what that means. Because remember, when he was studying DNA, he knew absolutely nothing about the structure of DNA. He didn't know that there was a specific structure that would only bond onto thymine. He didn't know that there was a specific structure of cytosine that would only bond onto guanine. He was trying to figure things out. So he discovered that adenine and thymine matched and that guanine and cytosine matched, which was very important. Okay, so that observation that in a sample of DNA, however many adenines you have is going to match however many thymines you have, and however many cytosines you have is going to match your number of guanines, that is known as Chargoff's rule. Okay, that is a rule, and yes, I do want you to know it. If I say Chargoff's rule, you better know that I'm talking about A equals T and G equals C. So, quick quiz. Yes, you do have to think about it. If a strand of DNA is 27% adenine, what is the percentage of thymine? So, I would like you to pause it right here for a couple of seconds and try and figure it out, given the information of Chargaff's rule, that A equals T and G equals C, okay? So hopefully, you pause it for a second, hopefully you thought about it, but this is actually not a trick question. It feels like one, but it's not. If A equals T and G equals C, and I tell you that 27% of a sample is adenine, that means that another 27% is going to be thymine as well, because A equals T. So if adenine is 27, thymine is also going to be 27. Question two, if a strand of DNA is 27% adenine, what is the percentage of guanine? Now you might be thinking to yourself, Ms. Siler, I can't figure that out because I only know that A equals T. 
Okay, cool. So let's think about it for a second, okay? A equals T, which means that if the sample is 27% adenine, it's also going to be 27% thymine. Okay, well, in any sample, there can only be 100% total, right? So let's, let's do some quick calculations here. 100 minus the 27% of adenine and also minus the 27% of thymine. So we're going to take 100 over here. We're going to minus 27 for adenine and we're going to minus 27 for thymine. If we do that math, we're going to get 46% left over. Okay? And that 46% has to be evenly distributed between guanine and cytosine because, again, G equals C. So all you have to do is say, okay, well, 46% is left over. Let's divide that by two. And we're going to get 23%. Okay? So guanine equals 23%. And we also know from that information that cytosine will also be 23% because G equals C. And then last but not least, I really hope that this is stuck in your brain by now, but what are the three parts of a nucleotide? Pause it for a second, see if you can remember them. Once again, hopefully you paused it, um, but we have a sugar a phosphate, and a base. If you wanted to get specific, you could tell me that that sugar is deoxyribose for DNA specifically, or if you were talking about RNA, it would be ribose. Okay. Next. We're going to talk a little bit more about the structure of DNA. Um, next person I would like to discuss is Rosalind Franklin. She used a technique called X-ray diffraction to take pictures of DNA. And this picture right over here was the picture that she took of the structure of DNA, um, which again, that might look really blurry and really grainy and really not great to you. But think about this. This was years and years and years ago. And also, we did not know what DNA looked like up until that point. We didn't know it was a double helix. We didn't know that A only bonded with T and C only bonded with G. We didn't know that information. And so we had no idea how it all worked. So this picture was actually super, super important for discovering that structure. Okay, so this is kind of an analysis of that photo. So this diagram here kind of shows you how you would be looking at that photo. Um, and it shows that those strands of DNA are twisted around each other in the double helix. So if you compare um, the layer lines, the 1050 over here to the 1050 over there, it kind of shows you the angle at which you're looking at it. So here's where it gets kind of janky. You may have heard before that Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, um, but you may not have heard before that the reason that they were able to figure it out was because they took that picture from Rosalind Franklin without her permission, and they didn't credit her with it at all. So what happened was, I think, I don't know if it was Watson and Crick themselves or if it was one of their lab assistants or something, but somebody took that picture that Rosalind Franklin had taken off of her desk and brought it to them. And they then used that to build a 3D model of DNA. And I'm not diminishing that discovery, but they didn't credit her at all for contributing to that discovery. And that, that morally was pretty janky. But they did build this 3D structure that you see in the picture to the left, and they are credited with discovering that structure. Okay, so another thing to realize about DNA is that the two strands run something called anti-parallel to one another. So what that means is 
If you look up here, you'll see something called the five prime, prime end of DNA, and you'll see that the other five prime end of the other strand, they're on opposite sides. So this picture kind of shows you, but the two DNA strands are running in opposite directions from one another. So if you think of this strand on the left as being upside right, that means that the other strand would be upside down. In all reality, upside right and upside down, it doesn't really mean much, but they do run opposite to one another. Something called a hydrogen bond is going to hold those two strands of DNA together. So whereas between our sugar of one and our phosphate of another, you're seeing this phosphodiester covalent bond in the little area that I circled here, between our bases in the middle, so everywhere I'm gonna draw a red line right here, that is a hydrogen bond between the bases. And again, hydrogen bonding and why it's important, why it's special is going to be something you'll learn about in chemistry. But for now, you just have to know that hydrogen bonds hold those strands together. Okay, so I've mentioned this a couple of times, the base pairing rules. A and T are gonna bond together, C and G are going to bond together. Adenine with thymine, guanine with cytosine. There are a few different ways that you can remember this. Sorry, one second, my phone is ringing. Sorry about that interruption. Um, anyway, there are a few different ways you can remember that A always bonds with T and C always bonds with G. Uh, but one way I always kind of thought about it to myself is that C and G are very round letters. If you think about it, they don't have a lot of angles in them. It's a lot of roundness. Whereas A and T are all right angles. They're all sharp letters. So that, I don't know why that helped me remember, but it did. So if you want to think about it like that, go for it. If you can't remember it that way, you can look up a hundred other ways to remember it. All right, DNA replication is next. So this is what is going to relate specifically to mitosis that we had just talked about, okay? Because remember, each cell needs to make a copy of its entire set of DNA before a cell can divide. So DNA replication is going to be the process that makes that copy so that each daughter cell can have a complete set of DNA molecules. Okay, so what happens is the DNA molecule, which you can see up here, this would be the original DNA molecule, it's going to start unzipping between its two strands. Okay, so you can see it kind of coming apart. One strand is going this way, the other strand is going that way. And then what happens after it unzips, because each strand of that double helix has all the info necessary to make the other strand, essentially another copy bonds on to both strands. Um, each one of these strands is said to be complementary to one, to one another. And what I mean by that is, look at this strand here. We have a sequence GAA. C-A-T. Now, if you look at this strand over here, let me just circle it with a different color. If you look at the right strand, it's not exactly the same because its sequence is C-U-U-G-U-A, uh, or I guess this is mRNA technically, but if it's DNA, all these U's are going to be T's. But again, the strands are not the same, but they do complement one another. Because if I just had the G, A, A, C, A, T, I can quite literally use my bonding rules to figure out what the other strand is. I know that C always bonds with G, so that strand would be C, T, T, G, T, A, which is exactly what it is over here. So that's what that complement means. They, they're not the same, but they complement one another. This little um, GIF here, this really, really old, really poorly made GIF, um, it represents how 
DNA replication happens, okay? So what you're seeing is you're seeing originally the strand unzipping and you saw other molecules move in and form new complementary strands onto it. You can see that happening as it goes. That DNA molecules, each nucleotide, that complement is forming onto the DNA. Okay, so let's watch it again. DNA molecule is being unzipped. We can see that happening. And as soon as the DNA molecule is unzipped, we see these little nucleotides coming in on either side of the unzipped strand and forming new complementary strands. And by the end, you see that there's now two complete copies of that DNA molecule, which is really cool. So here is another diagram of how DNA replication happens. I happen to like this diagram a lot because it kind of reminds you, hey, the whole purpose of this entire DNA replication process is eventually to form our two homologous chromosomes here, okay? Our, our chromosome chromatid pairs and all that fun stuff. So, once that DNA is unzipping at the replication fork, this here is the point of unzipping, then you'll notice that there's this little triangle molecule here called helicase. DNA helicase is the thing that unzips the DNA molecule, okay? So that enzyme is doing the unzipping. Then up here, the yellow that I'm outlining right here and here, those are called DNA polymerase. And that enzyme's job is to quite literally bring in loose nucleotides, which are these pieces that you're seeing, and bond the correct ones onto each strand. And that is the last that I'm going to say about DNA, DNA replication for now. Uh, the part two of these notes that we will talk about much, much later are protein synthesis, but again, we're not going to get there yet. So at this point, you should be done taking notes on your note sheet. Don't forget to submit that note sheet on Canvas.